So there's a really interesting article in the opinion section of the New York Times. This article went viral. You're about to see why it went viral. Basically, the gist of it is there's a top administration official that says, hey, I'm part of the resistance also. I'm trying to block what Donald Trump is doing. And don't worry, there are adults in the room. We know that the entire country thinks he's an unhinged lunatic. We agree that he's an unhinged lunatic. And so we're basically uh, blocking parts of his agenda that we disagree with and dislike. So that's the gist of the story. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you some hefty chunks of the story here, so you get a sense of exactly where this person falls. But uh, it's titled "I am part of the resistance inside the Trump administration. I work for the president." This is the subtitle. I work for the president, but like-minded colleagues and I have vowed to thwart parts of his agenda and his worst inclinations. President Trump is facing a test to his presidency unlike any faced by a modern American leader. So here's what uh, this anonymous person says. They asked the New York Times for anonymity. They granted it. And that, of course, is another huge aspect to this story. Twitter was blowing up over that with rampant speculation as to who could have written it. Um, but it, they say, or he or she says, the dilemma, which he does not fully grasp, is that many of the senior officials in his own administration are working diligently from within to frustrate parts of his agenda and his worst inclinations. I would know. I am one of them. To be clear, ours is not the popular resistance of the left. We want the administration to succeed and think that many of its policies have already made America safer and more prosperous. But we believe our first duty is to this country, and the president continues to act in a matter in a manner that is detrimental to the health of our republic. That is why many Trump appointees have vowed to do what we can to preserve our democratic institutions while thwarting Mr. Trump's more misguided impulses until he is out of office. The root of the problem is the president's amorality. Anyone who works with him knows he is not moored to any discernible first principles that guide his decision making. Although he was elected as a Republican, the president shows little affinity for ideals long espoused by conservatives. Free minds, free markets, and free people. At best, he has invoked these ideals in scripted settings. At worst, he has attacked them outright. In addition to his mass marketing of the notion that the press is the enemy of the people, President Trump's impulses are generally anti-trade and anti-democratic. Don't get me wrong, there are bright spots that the, the near ceaseless negative coverage of, of the administration fails to capture. Effective deregulation, his, historic tax reform, a more robust military, and more. All right, let me pause on that note. Okay. Just based off of that one little part right there, the don't get me wrong, there are bright spots, uh, historic tax reform, deregulation, a more robust military... I already know I despise whoever wrote this because this is exactly the kind of stuff that I've warned you about, that establishment Republicans love everything about Donald Trump minus the mean tweets. So in other words, their disagreement with him is on civility and tone, but everything in terms of his policies, they're like, oh, I pretty much agree with that wholesale. And the few instances where they disagree with him are instances where Trump isn't even necessarily wrong, where I think his instinct is right, even though the details of how he's implementing that instinct are not right. And what I'm referring to more specifically is trade. See, this is the kind of Republican that listens to Trump when he was on the campaign trail, railing against NAFTA, railing against the TPP, railing against outsourcing deals. And this kind of Republican goes, oh, he's wrong about those things. I disagree with him on those things. Obviously, we have to do the bidding of uh, the capitalists and corporatists and billionaires and corporations and outsource all the good paying U.S. jobs to third world countries and pay them uh, slave wages. So. I'm already annoyed by the people who would like fawn over whoever wrote this article, because on that alone, they're letting you know, oh, I kind of agree with most of him policy wise. And in the areas where I disagree with him, he's probably better on those issues. So, um, but I'm part of the resistance. No, you're not part of the resistance. That's not part of the resistance. 
that's, you know, you're an accomplice to every single thing that he's doing. And also, as Chris Hayes pointed out, and this is a good point, uh, this is this is more or less an insurance policy so that this might be people in the administration going, oh shit, we actually think something might happen with this Mueller investigation and we don't know uh, how certain Donald Trump's future is in the White House. So now we're all going to hedge and I'm going to write an article like this and then if slash when the shit hits the fan, they get to turn around afterwards and say, no, no, the problem isn't the Republican Party. The problem is just that one rogue actor, Donald Trump, and, you know, outside of him, we're all totally good, and we're, uh, we, you know, we're not classless, and we weren't part of the Trump agenda. He was an aberration. He's the single only bad guy here, and the rest of us are still perfectly fine. So it's a last-ditch attempt to save the Republican brand. I mean, that, that's a, certainly a strong possibility. But let me continue. I want to give you some more stuff that they say here. Or I should say he or she says here. Um, but these successes have come despite, not because of, the president's leadership style, um, which is adversarial, petty, and ineffective. Meetings with him veer off topic and off the rails. He in engages in repetitive rants, and his impulsiveness results in half-baked, ill-informed, and occasionally reckless decisions that have to be walked back. It may be cold comfort in this chaotic era, but Americans should know that there are adults in the room. We fully recognize what is happening, and we are and we are trying to do what's right, even when Donald Trump won't. All right, pause one more time again. Listen, if you're for deregulation, as this person says they are, if you're for the the tax cuts for the rich, and this person says they are, if you're for a more robust military, and this person says they are, you're not an adult. You're not the adults in the room. You're the kid in the class who's arguing with the teacher who thinks he's a genius and he's right about everything, but actually he's calmly getting schooled by the teacher. That's what you are. And by the way, in this analogy, the teacher I'm talking about is not Donald Trump. <laughs> the teacher would be the left. So for them to say, oh, there are adults in the room. But anyway, we did more deregulation, which is going to guarantee the next crash and in fact is going to speed it up. You're not an adult. You're an idiot. If you're going by the same economic policies that we had in the 19-teens and the 1920s that led to the Great Depression, you're implementing the same economic policies that Ronald Reagan did, which led to a crash right when he got out of office. You're implementing the same economic policies of Bill Clinton with getting rid of Glass-Steagall, George W. Bush um, with uh, put, doing more deregulation, more tax cuts for the rich. You're doing these same policies that blew a giant hole in the deficit and absolutely destroyed the economy, led to the subprime mortgage crisis and the Great Recession. If you back those policies, you're not an adult in the room. So let's just be clear about that. You're not an adult. I know you're trying to suck yourself off here and say, oh, Trump is bad, but us other Republicans are good, but you're not good. Trump sucks and you suck. Okay, more. It may be cold comfort in this chaotic era, but Americans should know that there are adults in the room. I already said that. We fully recognize what is happening and we are trying to do what's right even when Donald Trump won't. The result is a two-track presidency. Take foreign policy. In public and in private, President Trump shows a preference for autocrats and dictators, such as Vladimir Putin and North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un, and displays little genuine appreciation for the ties that bind us to allied, like-minded nations. Astute observers have noted, though, that the rest of the administration is operating on another track. One where countries like Russia are called out for meddling and punished accordingly, and where allies around the world are engaged as peers rather than ridiculed as rivals. Let me pause there also. 73% of the world's dictatorships are backed by the U.S. We give them weapons, we give them money. 73%. That, that's not like, oh, Donald Trump came in there and he started that policy. No, he went in there and he continued that policy, the same policy that was the case under Barack Obama, the same policy that was the case under George W. Bush. So, I, th this actually pisses me off more maybe than even the other part. And th the reason is, Donald Trump is a crude jackass, and he's an idiot, okay? But he doesn't bother trying to, like, mask U.S. imperialism and warmongering. Whereas Obama and George W. Bush, they pretended like we aren't warmongers, we aren't an imperialist nation as we acted that way. So for this person in the administration to act like, oh, I can't believe this president is fond of dictators. Other presidents aren't fond of dictators. What are you talking about? 
all the other presidents were fond of dictators. Trump is just open and honest about that fact. Which, by the way, I don't want to act like that's me giving Trump credit. It's not. I think he's too stupid to do the tap dance that the other presidents do to mask it. But it is me saying they are substantively no different. It's not like if we got rid of Trump and Pence was president, all of a sudden tomorrow, boom, we cut off their relationship with the 73% of the world's dictators. We wouldn't do that, which is why this is fucking frustrating. More. Given the instability many witnessed, there were early whispers within the cabinet of invoking the 25th Amendment, which would start a complex process for removing the president. But no one wanted to precipitate a constitutional crisis. So we will do what we can to steer the administration in the right direction until, one way or another, it's over. This isn't the work of the so-called deep state, it's the work of the steady state. Okay. <laughs> now, let's... Let me give them credit in one sense, okay? And then I have so I have a lot of mixed feelings about this, as you could probably already tell. Are there some instances where you yes, any reasonable, pragmatic person, all other points aside about process and about the way the system should work and all that stuff? Can any reasonable person say that in certain scenarios you do want somebody to basically tame the toddler Donald Trump and take matters into their own hands. Yeah. And in fact, I'm going to get to a story a little bit later in this show that dives into that. There were instances where Trump, all he has to do is see one, like, negative news report about what's happening in Syria, and he literally is like, okay, let's go kill Assad and do it now. Why are we waiting? Let's go do it. So, in a situation like that, it's so, he, like they pointed out, he do, he has no principles, and he's deeply amoral, and he's a buffoon who can put his finger in the wind to go, which way is it blowing? I'm going to go in that direction. And there's no deep analysis. There's no thought. It's just, and it's so funny for a guy who ironically screams fake news all the time. When he saw the report on Syria, his initial instinct was not to scream fake news. It was to say, everything is exactly correct, and now I'm going to act in accordance with that, and I'm just going to go topple him, and I want to go take out Bashar al-Assad. So are there some instances where you want an adult to go, hmm... Pipe down, bitch. That's not happening. We're going to handle this like re uh, adults. Yes, there are some instances like that. So, in a sense, I get why everybody's like, oh, okay. It's good that there are people who are like winking and nodding and going, yeah, we know he's an idiot and we're basically placating him and finding a way to manage him while we try to do more reasonable things. So, on the one hand, I get that. But there are also... Like, when they say this isn't the work of the so-called deep state, it's the work of the steady state. You know, no, no, you don't get to say that. You don't get to say we're undermining the person who is democratically elected. And then also say, oh, but don't worry, it's not like there's this big conspiracy to work against him. No, that's literally what it is. <laughs> now, you can make an argument as to, no, this, here's why that is a good thing. But don't, don't give me that bullshit speak out of both sides of your mouth crap, because that's what that is. Like, oh, sure, we're undermining him, and it is a conspiracy, but just don't call it the deep state, It's because it's the steady state. No, 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 no. It is the deep state. It is the deep state. Now, you could say, well, traditionally, deep state really means more CIA than anything else, and this is not CIA, this is from within his own cabinet. Fair enough. But the fact remains, there are establishment figures who are aligned to undermine him. Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. But that is 100% the dynamic of what's happening, and you don't get to say, oh, it's, but don't call it a conspiracy, don't call it the deep state. Fuck off. At least be open and honest about what you're really doing here, and don't try to pretend like, we're all noble heroes. And then another important point is, dude, what about the precedent this sets? So imagine for a second, Bernie Sanders gets elected president, and you have some establishment-minded Democrats who are in his administration. And, you know, maybe they played the role well of pretending to be progressive, so everybody thinks they're really progressive. But no, if you scratch beneath the surface, you look beneath the surface, I think I mixed two analogies there, you can tell very quickly they're establishment Democrats. Well, how would we feel if an establishment Democrat was undermining Bernie Sanders, and at the same time acting like, no, we're a hero because crazy Bernie doesn't understand the nuances of our healthcare system, and he thinks he's somehow going to give us Medicare for all, which would catch us up to the rest of the developed world... But, uh, Bernie, that's too big of a change. We can't start from scratch. We have to be realistic. We have to be pragmatic. 
We can't do those things. So we're, uh, I'm part of the resistance from within Bernie Sanders White House, and I'm actively undermining what he's doing. I think that not only would I disagree with that person substantively, I think it would be fair to make an argument on principle as to why that shouldn't be allowed. Because Bernie Sanders agree or disagree with him in this hypothetical scenario, he was democratically elected. You were not democratically elected. Or maybe you were democratically elected, but you weren't on the top of the ballot. So, I don't, it's a little weird to me that people would just cheer this and not think about the implications of it and not think about the precedent that this sets. Because I, it's almost like with the Alex Jones thing. Oh, he it talks about how, uh, you know, the media's against me and the establishment's against me. And then they kind of take this crackpot who's wrong about 96% of the shit he says, but they proved him right in that instance that there actually was a big tech conspiracy to deplatform him because he got pulled down from all these different platforms all at the same time. So the way you, you know, debunk the conspiracy theorist is not to have a smoke-filled back room with all the billionaire tech CEOs that then act on him and censor him. <laughs> so, you see what I'm saying? So with Trump, it's a similar thing. It's like, oh, the fake news media is against me, and the fucking, uh, the establishment's against me, and it's me versus the system, and I'm for the little guy. And then people, you know, basically do something like this, and they act as if they're heroes, when this is not going to be viewed among people who even just lean in support of Trump. This is not going to be viewed as, oh, these people are heroes. It's going to be viewed as, oh my God, the deep state subverting the democratic will of the people with our elected leader. So, I, it's a difficult situation, man. It's a difficult situation. I have, ver I have mixed feelings about this for sure. And then like I pointed out before, this is also an attempt where if slash when it goes wrong, people will go, oh, that was, Trump was bad, but all the other Republicans are good, even though our policies are like 90% aligned with Trump, we're like, they'll pretend like the polar opposite of Trump, but you're not. Just because you're not like him in tone does not mean you're, you dislike him substantively. In fact, you are very like him substantively. And then the final thing I'll bring up is this. There was a, a, a word used in the article. The word is Lodestar, L-O-D-E-S-T-A-R. Don't feel bad if you don't know what that word means. I didn't know what it, me what it meant. I, in fact, I don't think I've ever heard that word before. It's a weird word to use. It's just not a word that's commonly used. And that word was in the article. Well, a reasonable thing to do if you're trying to figure out, hey, who wrote this article? Who's the anonymous source from within the Trump White House? A reasonable thing to do is to try to find, hey, is there any, do people in the White House, does anybody have a record of using that word? Well, come to find out, Mike Pence uses that word all the time. So, a lot of people are saying, oh, it's 100% Mike Pence who wrote this article. I wouldn't say 100%. That certainly is evidence that perhaps he wrote the article, but there's another possibility. That possibility is somebody's framing Mike Pence. It's either... Pence wrote it, in which case, holy shit, the vice president is actively undermining the president, and he dropped a fucking word that only he uses, and holy shit, there's going to be fireworks coming. Or somebody's purposely trying to undermine Pence and make it look like it's Pence to sow discord from within the White House and make it even more chaotic than it already is. Either way, that's wild. Either way, that's wild. And again, I don't know what's going to happen moving forward. It seems to me like they're laying the groundwork for plausible deniability if slash when the Mueller situation goes after Trump in a way that he might not be able to recover from. So it's kind of like an insurance policy. Let's distance ourselves a little bit so that if slash when the shit hits the fan, whoever wrote this piece is going to come out and say it was me. And I wasn't just representing me. I was representing every other Republican who's part of this administration. So you can't tar us with you work for Trump. And therefore, you, you know, you have no future. They'll say, no, we were actively working against Trump from within Trump's White House. So actually, we're heroes. Let us keep our power. Let us keep our clout and don't, you know, end our careers. So there, there's a lot of Machiavellian bullshit politics going on in this. Like I said, from a substantive perspective, in some ways, these people probably are the adults in the room and we're happy to have them there. Like in the sense where Trump's like, all right, kill Assad and do it today. That they're like, no, we're not going to do that. Yes, yeah, substantively, they would be right and Trump would be wrong on that. But then there's other issues where Trump's like, okay, I'm seriously going to pull out a NAFTA. And they're like, 
no, you can't do that. We're the adults in the room. We're going to stop it. And no, that's not an instance that's the same as war. That's an instance where Trump's instinct is actually correct. Again, I don't think the details of how Trump would do it are correct. I think he'd probably botch it a thousand ways. But on the core, the core point, the main point of, no, seriously, we have to get out of NAFTA and we have to find a way to bring manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. He's right about that. And they are incorrect about that. So it's weird because on the substantive stuff, it's mixed as to who would be right. It's a case-by-case -case basis thing. But as a matter of principle, this is a Weasley move, man. I mean, this is really Weasley. And, it, you know, it's not gonna... I don't think they look like heroes like they think they do. <laughs> like, in establishment media, they'll portray these people, Oh, yes, amazing, brave heroes. But again, from just a, a raw precedent perspective, Oh, is this really what we want to do? We want to have a system where a president can be elected... And then, you know, people from within his cabinet, who were not elected president, but they're part of the cabinet, they can just override him and do it willy-nilly and act like, no, that's totally fine. Because ironically, the same thing, they accuse Trump of like, oh, he doesn't care about our democratic institutions. True, he does have an authoritarian impulse, for sure. But so do you. Like, you don't get to say, oh, we're going to override the guy who um, can lead the policy direction of the country, and he was elected and then pretend like you're not anti-democratic. You are literally anti-democratic. We have a democratically elected president. Agree with him or disagree with him. Obviously, I massively disagree with him. But he's democratically elected, and then you're overriding him and pretending like he's the authoritarian. But so are you. So are you if you're saying, no, we're actually it's actually going to run through us first. So uh, as you can tell, I have mixed feelings on this. I think it's a really weird story. Um, but I'm curious to see what happens and where this goes. And then also just a final, final, final thing. This might be evidence that people already know something that we don't in the Mueller um, investigation. They might already know, like, okay, it's going to go down for real. And that's why we're distancing ourselves now. But <laughs> what a crazy story. We're living in uh, what appears to be a fictional movie type situation. That's what this feels like.